Russia's devastating war in Ukraine is raging on, and it continues to cause enormous human suffering. As we record this episode, how the conflict will be resolved is still completely unknown. Of course, we all hope that peace will prevail. Now, the war is also affecting the economy, and it's against that backdrop that we've just released our latest six monthly look at financial stability in the euro area, also known as the Financial Stability Review. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. Today, we're talking about how financial stability is faring as we emerge from the pandemic into this highly uncertain world. We'll look at how the financial system is doing and then zoom in on two areas where we see risks emerging, housing markets and crypto assets. I'm here today with my colleagues Tamara and John, who both work in our financial stability department at the ECB. Regulars to our podcast might know them from previous episodes on the topic. Tamara, John, a warm welcome to you both on the podcast. Really nice to have you back here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Glad to be back. Now, it's, it's a very complex situation that we find ourselves in, right, John? I mean, our economies had started to reopen as we emerged from the pandemic, and then war broke out on the edge of Europe. And we're now three months into Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And as we sit here speaking, there's no end in sight. Now, John, I'd like to start the conversation by asking you, uh, I call it a slightly more personal question. How has it been for you to, to look at this very difficult situation with your financial stability hat on? Well, uh, Katie, there have been, I would say, really both personal and professional aspects to uh, to this whole situation of the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, on the personal side, waking up on the, on the morning of the 24th of February to the news that Russia had invaded Ukraine was actually quite a shock mm. uh, for me. And as you might imagine, the financial stability consequences were, were not my first thought. Uh, reading news reports of explosions in Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa and the Donbass and of Russian tanks rolling across the border into their homeland, my thoughts were with the people of Ukraine and the fear that they must have been feeling at that very moment. Since then, I, I think the whole world has been inspired by the incredible bravery of Ukrainian people in defending their country. Um, the human suffering, uh, <coughs> as you mentioned, of course, has been unspeakable. And I've seen estimates from the, the Kiev School of Economics suggesting that the cost of the conflict for Ukraine uh, could rise to $600 billion. So that's about four times the nation's annual GDP. My goodness. We haven't seen such devastation of a European country since the Second World War, and um, uh, we can only hope that the conflict will be swiftly brought to a peaceful conclusion. And so that's uh, the personal side of it. I can certainly attest to that, that, that level of emotion. I mean, I've definitely seen that uh, in myself and also amongst colleagues when working on this really, really tough topic. On the professional side, um, the work that we do in the financial stability area, I mean, it re really aims at assessing the likelihood of financial crisis. So maybe, you know, crises like the one that we saw after the collapse of Lehman Brothers in, in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, we also advise um, on policy options. Now that work tends to draw, uh, I would say, on, on past experience with similar situations. Yeah. Um, I think Mark Twain put it nicely when he said that history uh, never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. and. <laughs> Looking to past events usually helps us to make a start uh, with our analysis. Now, in preparing this issue of the FSR, we had literally no experience to draw from. I mean, uh, it's completely it unprecedented, isn't it? Unprecedented, yeah. Um, so where do you start on analysing the consequences of a war in Europe? Now, there's plenty of examples in the FSR, but if I take a very specific example, you will have seen uh, that we focus a lot in the FSR this time on commodity markets and, and also on commodity derivatives markets. Now, commodities are things like raw goods, right? Like wheat, oil, grain, grass, oil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, also, yeah, exactly. So before the war, um, our knowledge and experience with these markets was very limited. Um, but with energy prices soaring because of fears of shortages, um, we had to learn quickly uh, if we were to make useful uh, assessments for, 
the policy makers. I think one big advantage we have um, is the diversity of knowledge and expertise of our, of our financial stability experts. Um, as you might imagine, for a central bank, we have many macroeconomists, mm -hmm. um, but we also have people with business, legal, computer programming, and even physics backgrounds. Um, and we also have a wide network of contacts uh, working in the financial industry, um, and basically in all of the major global centers, um, financial centers. So that, that means that if we don't know something, uh, we can quickly find someone in our market intelligence network uh, who does. Mm. And then I would see, say last, but certainly not least, and I've seen this time and again at times of crisis, uh, people take their duty as European public servants uh, very seriously. Uh, they really pull together and make extraordinary efforts uh, to produce well-informed analysis. Absolutely. Now, let's look at how financial stability is, is actually faring in this, this really tough environment. John, I'd like to start with a kind of big picture of, of what's going on. Can you give us a snapshot of how things are looking from the financial stability perspective? So that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> yes, big I'm afraid it Katie. is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I, I start with a, bir with a bird's eye view. Um, I think arguably we're in the middle of a paradigm shift uh, where supply side shocks to the economy are becoming more and more important. Now, what I mean here is that economic structures are changing. We see it with the transition that climate change is, is forcing from fossil fuels to renewable sources of, e sources of energy. Uh, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, also demonstrated how reliant we are on global supply chains and just how sensitive those uh, supply chains are to shocks. I mean, I'm sure you will remember the pictures of the tanker that blocked the Suez Canal uh, for six days in March last year. I was just about to mention that example, actually. And how we all <laughs> suddenly understood how that disrupted uh, global trade. Yeah. Now, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, geopolitical risks have come to the fore. And in our view, it has blighted um, a financial stability outlook that was already impaired, actually, mm. by higher than expected inflation and a loss of economic growth momentum. So the main message that we have this time uh, is that financial stability conditions have deteriorated mm. uh, since last November. Uh, maybe if I could just mention a few of the reasons for that. Please do. So well first, uh, before the invasion, as I mentioned, we had concerns about the building up of vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities we saw building up in financial and in housing markets, uh, also on private sector balance sheets. And then as the war had led to amplified um, inflation expectations, lowered growth, growth expectations, and that was in, in fact a kind of a supply side shock and constellation of triggers that we really feared the most from the macroeconomic point of view. Many of those vulnerabilities are now amplified relative to where we were last November. So you've got a lot of things that were kind of already there because of the pandemic or largely because of the pandemic and then the war came and Precisely. just yes. so made them uh, all worse. It just made the situation uh, even worse. Yeah. And then a second point uh, that we have been saying for a long time in the Financial Stability Review um, is that we thought that financial asset prices, uh, and I'm talking specifically about um, equities, Stocks bonds, and shares. Stocks and shares, exactly. They were difficult to reconcile. The prices were difficult to reconcile with the fundamentals. Um, so they, they were basically overvalued uh, compared to yes, the I mean, actual situation we on the ground, shall we say? Absolutely. And I think we were, we, we, were, we were pretty clear about that. And now with interest rates rising, um, both long term um, on both sides of the Atlantic and then in the US also short term, uh, those fragilities are being exposed. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that a correction is, is now ongoing in the US stock market and it is spread um, also to the stock markets of the euro area. Then um, a third point, after the stresses uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic um, had imposed on basically all um, non-financial sectors, rising uh, interest rates and input costs, so again, what I was speaking about earlier, energy, uh, also non-energy costs, uh, we think that that is likely to test the resilience of, of balance sheets. Now, non-financial, we mean things like companies and firms. And firms, and, yeah. and, also, and also households. Um, also so households. Yeah. So if we were to just take a look, for instance, at household balance sheets, um, we, have a, we have a chart on page 32 of, of the FSR, and it shows the fraction of household income that European households spend on food and energy. And you can see there on that chart uh, that 60% of households were spending uh, more than 20% of their income on food and energy 
uh, well, before the war, there's, we have a two-year average period for the construction of that church, but you could say that that was the situation mm. essentially before the war. And the war has caused, as we know, a surge in the prices of both uh, food and, uh, and energy prices, and that's going to make it more difficult for households to make you know, mortgage payments, and also as, as interest rates rise. And then fourth, um, maybe different to what many analysts thought at the start of the outbreak, maybe we could ourselves include it here, uh, the banking sector has remained remarkably resilient um, and profitability has uh, recovered strongly. But we have in a way what I would call a deja vu um, on the banking sector outlook now because while we do think that the sector is, is likely to prove resilient to the fallout from the, from the war, arguably we're also back to where we were in late 2019 before mm. the pandemic where we had concerns about low profitability uh, in the banking sector and that that could pose um, risks for financial stability um, going forward. Actually, the, the last example that you've given, John, with, with the banks uh, brings me on to my next question because you said there's a kind of positive sign there that banks have been more resilient than perhaps uh, expected. There's obviously a lot of darkness in, in what's going on at the moment for people, uh, for companies, uh, as, you've, as you've described. But have you seen any more positive signals, um, anything that, dare I say it, might offer some hope? Well, yes. Actually, we, we were, we're very careful this time uh, in the FSR to balance our assessment of the sources of risks and vulnerabilities against our assessment of the resilience of, of, of the financial sector, mitigating factors and so on. So I, yeah, I already mentioned the resilience of the banking sector. Um, the sector has basically recovered from the adverse economic consequences of the pandemic. And in the end, when we look back, it was largely it turned out to be largely a hit to profitability mm. um, of the sector and capital positions were even strengthened last year. Um, now we have the war and, and we find that direct exposures of euro area banks to Russia and Ukraine proved to be small mm -hmm. um, and, and where they were small proved to be mostly manageable. Now, if we're a bit more forward looking, uh, we have a box in, in the FSR, box six. Uh, you can find the results in that box of a vulnerability analysis that we carried out um, in partnership with our banking supervision colleagues uh, to assess how the sector would fare um, if energy and food commodity prices were to rise uh, by even more than, mm. than, than what we have seen so far. Okay. Um, and that analysis, um, it confirms the resilience of the sector. Okay, that's good news. That, that's good that's news because it means that, that banks can then keep lending to the economy during these difficult times. Absolutely. And then if we look outside the banks, uh, to the non-banks, um, they too largely weathered the shock of the war um, without any major incidents. Um, Non-banks are things like insurers, in right, investment yes. funds. Exactly. Yeah. So, and if we look at if we look at the investment funds, for instance, uh, we did see the usual pattern that we almost always see during episodes of, uh, of market stress: safe haven flows to the U.S. bond market. But we didn't really see suspensions on outflows. So that's when you know, investors in funds are looking to get their money back because they're in a panic and then s s funds can suspend payments. Uh, that didn't really happen except for, for funds that were, that were focused on, on, on Russia, of course. So that's quite different to what we saw at the start of the pandemic, isn't totally it? Totally different, yep. totally different, yeah. So I mean, I would say uh, it's not all doom and gloom in this issue of the FSR, Katie, and if the war were to end quickly, um, our assessment would undoubtedly improve. Okay, that's, that's good news. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that it's not all doom and gloom, John. Now, Tamara, I'll turn to you now. Um, let's go into a little bit more detail on one of the points that John has been mentioning, and that's higher inflation. What have you seen in, in the Financial Stability Review on, on higher inflation? Well, the first thing is inflation is a big theme of this Financial Stability Review, which might not at first sight seem obvious because we're not the natural people to focus on price stability. Um, the same thing is also inflation can be a bit of a false friend for financial stability, at least at first sight, because as the general price level increases, the value of outstanding debt will fall ah, indeed, in real yeah. terms. Uh, so in principle, if inflation also rises faster than interest rates on that debt, the debt payments also get smaller in real terms mm. too, so it helps borrowers yep. in theory, inflate away your debt. <laughs> but there are two snags to this, and ah. I think that's where we get into in the FSR 
The first is the debt risk for the whole financial system depends on the capacity of the most heavily indebted borrowers to keep paying their debts as prices rise. And the second is how financial markets and lenders react to higher inflation environment and the knock-on effects that that will have for financing conditions going forward for everyone. So maybe if I come back to that first point on debt servicing capacity, here the issue is the type of inflation that we've seen and John was talking how that was really coming through in terms of higher prices. That's where we start for a lot of it. There's, I think there's more complexity to the mm-hmm. inflation story than, a, than simply that at this point, but certainly price rises for goods have been dominant, specifically energy and commodities. So if you're a heavily indebted business, for example, maybe a start there. And I can imagine there are quite a few after the pandemic, right? Exactly, and that's a theme we've picked up on for s- several FSRs. The impact on your business finances depends on how much you rely on those types of commodities in order to produce your services, mm-hmm. and also whether or not you can pass the price rises on to your customers. Ah, I can imagine that's quite difficult at the moment because companies aren't they're trying to recover after the pandemic so they don't want to then increase their prices to kind of dissuade the customers from coming well it can vary right so it depends on what type of business you are and your Mm. power in the market i think one of the things that we've looked at in this financial stability review is in the box um box three we look a bit at firms and the types of margins different firms seem to be able to get away with Mm -hmm. And there we do find a trend where actually more heavily indebted firms seem to have lower margins to begin with, which might suggest that they tend to have more margin squeeze. And also smaller firms tend to have more trouble uh, with margins than larger firms. So they're already heavily indebted and then even worse, they're they're Mm. earning less money on what they do. Exactly. They're more likely to face the squeeze. The second thing you actually you just mentioned that there about um, how the pandemic coming after the pandemic and the other thing we we try and identify is who are the firms that are getting this double whammy effect of they haven't quite recovered from the pandemic or they're more affected by the pandemic and they also probably are more hit by some of the price shocks and supply shocks we're seeing now and there we do find a few sectors um, accommodation food services airlines mm, that yeah. may be in that more vulnerable category. Um, so th- those that's where one aspect of inflation comes through. How easy will they find it to keep servicing their debt? I mentioned a second point as well. So that's about paying your existing debt. The second is um, what happens to financing conditions and financial markets as inflation rises, particularly if you get a sort of sustained period of higher than expected inflation. So first thing is, If inflation rises faster than nominal interest rates, actually borrowing costs fall in real terms. And I think that's about where we are at the moment. But if higher inflation persists, that's really unsettling for markets and it can lead to really abrupt increases in rates because investors want to start hedging inflation much more in their portfolios. And they also want compensation for higher inflation because borrowers might be inflating away their debt. The people lending them to them want to recoup that back um, in the medium term. And this is this whole idea that people go to the markets to get credit, essentially, because you, you don't just go to a bank, can you? You can also sell your stocks and shares and get money that way. Exactly. Well, you can go to the markets and you can go to the bank. And yep. anyone lending you money, if inflation was to be more elevated for longer, would want to start wanting compensation. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, for that. And we've already seen a lot more volatility in recent months. Um, John was talking about how investors have been adjusting um, uh, in markets. And also adjusting to shifts in monetary policy in parallel because monetary policy is now trying to address the situation. For financial stability, we don't just focus on what's happening in general to financial costs, but also how it varies for different borrowers. And I think that's one thing that we've honed in a bit on this financial stability mm-hmm. report. So the technical term we'll use is credit risk premia. So um, not just the, the lowest risk borrowers, but um, you also, if you're a high risk borrower, you pay a premium on that. And what we do find is that for more risky borrowers, they can face a double hit of higher risk-free rates and then also higher credit risk premia. Mm -hmm. The latter is more uncertain, um, but these do tend to rise. Uh, We have evidence that these tend to rise when these rates rise. I think at the moment we haven't really seen large moves in those spreads yet, not not things that we've seen even in 2012 or, or in 2008. That's good news, but they have picked up a bit. The spreads are the difference between 
extra price you pay if you're a higher risk borrower yep. than a lower risk borrower. Uh, so that's something we want to flag, is that's something we keep an eye on, is how will those financing conditions ca- change in the future. I think my overall message is to try and say that maintaining price stability really will support financial stability in the end as well. So there, lots of bits of the ECB's role go in harmony. Got it. Let's take a closer look now at something that I personally find a very interesting part of um, financial stability because it affects many of us, and that's house prices. Now, John, for years, there's been talk of a, of a bubble in terms of house prices. What's going on at the moment? I mean, indeed, stories about housing market bubbles were rampant in the press uh, earlier this year, I would say. If you were to search the term house price bubble on, on Google Trends, um, you'll see that maximum interest in the topic was reached at the end of March mm. uh, globally um, and a month later in, in Germany and, and, and other European countries. Now, in the episode, we're not actually saying there is a bubble, uh, but we do have concerns about the interaction between, on the one hand, rising house prices, rapid mortgage credit growth, and now um, the war-induced strains that I mentioned earlier uh, the difficulties that, that, that households are, are facing as, as the basic necessities um, of food and energy consumption mm. um, is absorbing a larger fraction of, of their incomes. We had already warned <coughs> in the episode that signs of overvaluation in, in, in the euro area housing markets were becoming a source of concern for financial stability and I think we had that in both issues uh, last year and then the latest uh, euro area aggregate data so that's data that covers <coughs> the euro area for as long as the euro area has existed mm-hmm. is now showing uh, actually the highest rate of house price inflation in at least the last 20 years oh wow. I would say. so this does look to be partly driven um, by rising costs of building houses so again uh, back to the supply side theme yeah, because um, the materials are harder to get, obviously, that then has a knock-on effect exactly to them. Exactly, yeah. so the commodity price surge is also spilling over into into activities like like that, like housing, building, construction more yeah. generally. Um, but at the same time, we, we, we can't exclude that we may be entering um, a dangerous uh, house price credit spiral. So that's one where house prices are rising and then people are borrowing more to buy a, to pay for the price of a larger house and all and on and on that causes house prices to rise and then we get into this this spiral where we have that we have seen um history has shown us that those that those spirals can be very very dangerous when they reverse now this looks like it could be the case or we could be on the border of it in some countries um, with the euro area um, already and in fact the european systemic risk board uh, had been issuing uh, warnings to countries about their housing market vulnerabilities over the last year Many have taken countermeasures, um, yeah. primarily by activating uh, macroprudential policies. Uh, but then, in addition, though, to the mitigating factors that, are, that I already mentioned, um, and we do see another one, uh, we, we've seen an important shift uh, to fixed rate uh, mortgage lending in the euro area over the last decade or so. So, the consequence of this is that interest rate risk. So, that's you know, the change in the financing burden that a household may face if interest rates were to change. That risk has actually moved away from households, and it's now with the banks um, to the extent that they have been lending fixed. Because the the interest rates on these loans is, is fixed for for a long period of time. So what happens exactly? What happens to the interest rate? Right, doesn't have a difference. It will it? have no impact. Yeah. Um, it, it will have it will have an impact on on, on new uh, on people who are taking out new mortgages. Absolutely, yeah. But, but not for on those people that who already have one. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't mean that the risk has gone away. It's just moved somewhere else. Um, and the ability of the system uh, to, to absorb the risk, it really depends on how well, on how well the banks uh, are managing it. And we, 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 we have spent, we've devoted some space to that issue um, in the financial stability review. Okay, so definitely an area to, to keep an eye on. Thank you, John. Now, there's one more topic that I'd like to talk about in a little bit more detail today, which is also one that uh, people have been keeping a very close eye on recently, and that's crypto assets. Now, we've touched on this in previous financial stability podcasts, and we'll obviously link to those in, in the show notes. But Tamara, in this issue of the Financial Stability Review, you've taken a closer look specifically at the risks that crypto assets could pose to financial stability. Now, before we get into the risks themselves, could you give us a bit of background 
what what is the state of what we call the crypto asset universe at the moment? Um, so indeed, we've given more attention to this in this FSR. Some colleagues have written in very nice special feature on it. And what they set out is it's really been growing um, a lot um, in a few ways. So overall size has increased about tenfold in two years. Tenfold. Yeah, that's what they get to. And then we still think it's less than, um, although we still think it's less than one percent of the financial system in total size, and it's growing really beyond Bitcoin, which is probably the one that everyone knows. And there's about 20 plus unbacked crypto tokens that have a capitalization or a small equity size. There's also now lots more exchanges and lots more activity going on. I think most of us are pretty aware of that. Actually, every time we open social media, I think we're being confronted by this this um, ex ex offers. Of yeah, this, absolutely. Uh, so it has been expanding, and it's also been expanding in a number of other dimensions in terms of um, in terms of products that sit alongside the crypto assets themselves. So contracts that can be taken, derivative style contracts that can be taken around them, but also connections to other parts of the digital economy. So what they call decentralized finance, so DeFi. So, so there's a general growth in what they our authors have labeled the ecosystem of crypto assets. So a de derivative contract is something, a contract that derives its value from this Yes, it asset. might not be having the crypto itself, but yeah. it's a contract in and around the value of a particular mm. crypto, either in the future or relative to another asset or something like that, and there's, there's various of them that are being offered. So I think that's how it's grown. What hasn't changed is it's still a very volatile asset class, so people are very interested in it, but we also keep seeing these repeated surges yeah and falls um, not least uh, most recently i think i saw something that the price fell by more than 98 percent overnight which is just an example of it it's it's instability the terror example yeah, yeah exactly so this is in the stable coin um uh it's the set stable coins which are a slightly different group of crypto assets they're the backed assets but it's all i think part of the big story of how much interest has grown in these markets and backed is where it's it has an intrinsic value i mean in the sense that it's linked to something else yes yeah, so stable coin actually we talked about stable coin in the last fsr in november but these ones have um a set of assets that might be be behind them and people might have different views on how robust that is uh, but crypto will be unbacked okay so the crypto asset market has grown but it's still a very small part of the global financial system now, of course, that doesn't mean that the risks are any less important. What have you found in terms of the risks that these crypto assets pose then for financial stability? So for us in financial stability, the thing that we've been paying most attention to is how this crypto asset um, universe is getting more and more in touch with the traditional financial system mm -hmm. and also how um, it's growing. So I mentioned um, that the development of these contracts that that can be taken in and around crypto. And what the um, what we look at in this FSR is how on the back of that, it, r it allows people to get what they call levered interest into crypto assets. So that means that you, you only need to put a small amount of money down at the beginning in order to get an exposure, but that exposure could lead to bigger losses for you. Oh, I see, later. yeah. Um, and once we see those developments happening, it means that you start to see a sort of more sophisticated type of financial market around it. Other things that we picked up on are people being able to use crypto as collateral in lending for cash, so normal uh, lending activities, and the growing interest, and I think this is probably the heart of our campaign, is the growing interest of establishment financial sector entities, so different types of investment funds, other funds, and even banks, getting more and more interested, not necessarily engaging in scale, mm. but showing more and more interest in in um, how they interact with crypto assets. And so that's where we could see potential risks. And the reason the risks arise is because relative to other assets, crypto is still much less regulated. It's um, the entities are regulated that yep. get involved in them, but the asset class itself sees is much harder to govern and regulate. And I think people are working hard now on getting standardized data and disclosure around it, and then going from there to see what regulation is required. So it's becoming a lot more connected uh, with the financial system and, and the fact that it is unregulated means it, it brings a danger with it then? Yes, 
Um, so it, the difference in regulation when you've got a part of the system that's regulated to a very different degree than the core yeah. financial system, that's often a sign of where arbitrage and other forms of trouble can lurk. Okay, so another one to be keeping a very uh, close eye on. Thanks a lot to both of you, Tamara and John. But before we wrap up, um, we do always have a question that we ask all our guests on the podcast, and that's for a hot tip linked to the topic that we're discussing today, so financial stability. John, have you thought of something to perhaps inspire our listeners? So I think this time I'll give you a book recommendation. Um, and it's really based on um, at, at times of adversity in my life, and I think that this perhaps has been one of those times. Um, I've often found myself returning to, to read extracts of meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Um, not only was he a Roman emperor, uh, but he was also a, a Stoic philosopher, and his 1800-year-old writings, I think, still have relevance uh, today. Uh, one thing that he teaches us is that adversity should be welcomed with gratitude as an opportunity to prove one's courage, fortitude, and resilience. Well, it's a book I know and love myself, so I'm very much behind that book recommendation. I think it's really relevant in, in today's time. Thank you, John. Now, Tamara, I remember last time, I think you had a couple of film recommendations. Um, what have you got for us today? Well, today, I think reflecting on events, for me, I've been... We've talked a lot about financial stability. There's also been these broader economic discussions about how events uh, might affect globalisation. Um, our president's talked about the peace dividend and, and these concepts. Um, and I've been trying to get behind some of the history of it. So my recommendation is a podcast, a rival podcast. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Allowed this one time. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty popular one called The Rest is History. And um, they have a series of really um, insightful podcasts that go way back, I think, into both events happening in Russia and Ukraine and also more broadly that help provide really some context to what we're seeing, I think, at the moment. I found them very informative anyway. The rest is history. Okay, I'll definitely be checking that one out uh, tonight. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks again to Tamara Shakia and John Fell, from our financial stability department for joining the conversation and giving us their insights. And you can, of course, check out the show notes for further reading on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.